All right, before the internet goes out, once again, we're going to go ahead and get started. There is enough of us here. Um, so, <laughs> hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us and welcome to the 27th episode of SEO for Bloggers. Today, we're going to talk about how to make money with your blog and all the technical aspects behind it with everyone's favorite experts, Arsene Rabinovich, Andrew Wilder, and a very special guest, Abby Rodriguez. And as always, I'm your host, Ashley Segura. So thanks for tuning in with us today. As always, we're going to have Q&A at the very end. So make sure and drop your questions in the actual Q&A box. Uh, if you drop any questions in chat, we cannot guarantee that they will be answered. So please make sure you put them into the Q&A uh, actual box at the bottom of Zoom. And if we're not able to get to all of them live, we do make sure every single question is answered in the recap blog post, which is published about one week after the webinar goes live. Okay. So without further ado, let's get started talking. Abby, start us off with sharing a little bit about yourself and how long you've been blogging. Yeah, so I actually, I started blogging back in 2010. I started as a fashion blog and then it turned into a mommy blog. And then 2015 rolled around and I was like, hey, people are making money off of this. I should probably niche down. So I started a food blog called The Butter Half. And then approximately 2017 rolled around and I was like, hey, people, food bloggers love each other and they love hanging out. And there is not like this, this vision that I had for creating this community for food bloggers and content creators. And it's like this conference needs to exist. So then I found a tastemaker conference and five years later, here we are doing all the food blogging things, content creation in the food space have a lot of experience learning how to make money doing that. So I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us and definitely agree with Amy. It's definitely the best conference ever. Um, can you share a little bit about what it looked like at the beginning of your blog monetization? Like how long did it take before you actually started making money from your content? And what were your numbers like? As yes, in, so like traffic numbers, sorry. Yes, 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 yes. Um, so full transparency around that. Like I made the bulk of my income off of freelance work and doing uh, content creation for you know, other larger magazines, but I was able to um, start monetizing around, you know, when Mediavine had the 25,000 or 25,000 sessions per month threshold, which it's, it's gone up significantly now, but, um, you know, I was able to get on when I was like at the peak of like 50,000 sessions, things like that. So it's never was something that was like this massively huge traffic earner for me, but, um, I really leaned into the concept of multiple, uh, income streams and not just putting all my eggs in one basket. I remember, um, listening to a, a podcast episode with Bjork, uh, on food blogger pro, which, Arson just had his episode come out. So full circle there, um, you know, and, and really like leaning into that concept of, oh, I really want to make sure I diversify. So, you know, doing brand partnerships. And that was the thing, like, I feel like there was some of that passive income with the ad revenue. There were brand partnerships, there were freelance opportunities, um, you know, some affiliate marketing, things like that. And so I, and then it turned into a thing of consulting, right? And that's ultimately how Tastemaker came about because I had so many people asking me, how do you make money from a blog? And, you know, I was not, again, having these huge numbers, but it was income for me that was working and growing consistently. And so I realized there's actually a lot of value and, and money to be made from education and, and events in, in the food space too. So that's, that's where that started. How long was it that you were starting to make money from the actual content itself before you decided, okay, I, I need to have multiple incomes. Like this isn't just going to be my only income or was it right away that you were like, this is nice, but it's not something I can rely on hundred percent right now. Yeah. So I actually started making money in the process of when influencer marketing became a thing before it was even called that in, I would say like 2012, the 2012 to 2015 years of doing partnered work, brand, brand partnerships, things like that. And I was not taking it seriously. I was like, oh, this is just a hobby. Oh, I guess this person wants to pay me for product placement or to represent or be a brand ambassador, whatever the deliverables they were asking for. And I, that's when I had that realization with creating a food blog specifically, because like people like this content, they want this content, they're engaging with it. 
And that 2015 was the decision when I was like, this is my job. I am going to make this my career, right? And it, it really was more than anything, I think a mindset shift. So it wasn't so much numbers mm-hmm. as it was like, I am going to do this. And then I feel like that held me accountable to to invest and move the needle in in those ways that would help me get to the point where I wanted to make X amount of dollars. So um, yeah, I would say that it, in terms of the actual food block side of things though, it happened pretty, pretty quickly because I already had those existing relationships that I just simply, I funneled into food content and I came back to these people and was like, Hey, this is what I'm doing now. Right. And really trying to focus on as much as I could with SEO, but like, that was not a big thing for me. Um, I didn't know a lot about it and I went through the whole Casey audit and, and all of that and had been down that path too. And that definitely helped um, a lot in terms of just trying to focus on SEO and being able to qualify for media buying and get on that way. Um, and, you know, it's still like a consistent thing. Like I, I abandoned my food blog for two years during the pandemic and really to hone in and focus on Tastemaker and now trying to resurrect it and implement new strategies, you know, so that ultimately I can still come back to the community and say, you know, food blogging is not dead. It's not at this thing where it's oversaturated and you can't do it because everyone's doing it. You know, I, it's existing almost as a case study for myself in 2022, 2023, 2024 to be like, Hey, I started these practices doing this and look how much the growth has happened there. So while I could say, yes, it took two to three years. It depends on your goal. (laughs) (laughs) Well done. Well done. I, I love that you mentioned that, you know, even as in a saturated market, there's still so much opportunity because there's a lot of new bloggers who tune in and just have a really hard time with, okay, well, where do I start? How am I really going to take off? How am I going to be different? And you really narrowed yourself in and got rid of all the other verticals and niched down. And that's such a great strategy. Um, Arson, from a technical standpoint, where would you even begin to ensure that your blog is well positioned for monetization? Right. So, you know, from a technical standpoint, you want to watch out for a few things. Uh, they can impact or affect uh, uh, your current SEO. So, like, if you're at a point where you're building up uh, uh, um, to to the point where you're like you're 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 getting those numbers and you're ready getting ready to start monetizing. Uh, you want to make sure that you continue doing that. So, with the addition of ads, a lot of times you're going to see a little bit of an impact on your on your on your uh, web performance. Uh, and Andrew, we can, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, so, you want to make sure that before you start doing that, that everything is already kind of in place, right? So, you want to be very mindful of your core web vitals, how quickly things are loading. So, you want to make sure, from a technical perspective, that your site is in tip-top shape. Uh, and majority of that will be with web performance. So, speed, core web vitals, uh, cutting down on those image sizes, all of that. Uh, um, and I think that's pretty much it from like a technical perspective. There's things you can do with like your content and everything else and be careful about, you know, affiliate stuff, uh, uh, but speed and web performance would be the, the, the main thing that you want to worry about. What would happen if, if you don't have your technical base, like are ad companies just not going to reach out to you or is it more of a user issue or what are the negative side effects to not? Right. So we all know, numbers? right. So we all know that, that, you know, uh, web performance is important. Uh, uh, page speed is very important. It helps, you know, with rankings. Uh, if you are already not doing so well and you layer in the ads and uh, let's say you're working, I'm not going to name uh, uh, the, 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 the ad network, but there's certain ad networks that, uh, um, uh, that are not optimized uh, uh, in the delivery process and do slow down your website. Uh, and in some situations when I do consulting and I do coaching and audits, uh, we look at it and we're like, hey, look, so this ad network is really, we look at core vitals and we're looking at what, what's loading, what's slowing down the site. And we can look at it and say, look, you know, the, the very little money that you're making with this very, you know, not top shelf ad network that you're with right now while you're waiting to, to, to go to, the bigger players like MediaMind and AdThrive is really harming you. So the money that you're, the, the few pennies, the few dollars that you're making through these ads is not worth the 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 damage that you're causing through web performance to your ability to rank and 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 and, and gain more traffic. That makes a lot of sense, um, Andrew. On the technical aspect, still, um, what are some plugins that you'd recommend having, or are there any technical features that you should have enabled? 
Well, I think it depends on where you are in your monetization journey. <laughs> it depends. So for those of you on the call who are oh. not yet <laughs> on it, with Media Drive, I'm just gonna I'm gonna pile them all in there just like a big old bowl of candy corn. Um <laughs> sorry. Uh so so I think um, you know, we've we've talked a lot in previous um webinars about all the technical elements and we just shared a couple links for for site speed. Um, you know, I think you want to be building a site that works well for your visitors. That's the most important thing, right? So, um, it, you know, it's all the same recommendations really for that kind of thing. Um, if you're going to work with a larger network like Mediavine and AdThrive, they have their own tech stack. You know, they're, you're going to install their plugin and they're just going to take care of the ad serving. Um, it's one of the beautiful things about them is they just take care of it, right? And and then you can work with them to optimize it, but it's all added automatically. If you are trying to monetize before that and you're trying to DIY it, um, you can use certain plugins to help with that. You know, you could start with AdSense. Um, it's a real simple tool to just drop in, you know, an ad tag. Um, I think I'm going to sort of pivot this question and say the thing you shouldn't do is hard code any ad tags or short codes. That's a big mistake I've seen people make. So um, if you are, are, you know, literally like writing a post and inserting the code for an ad into a post, that seems really convenient and easy. But once you do that on a, on 50 posts and then you decide you're going to Mediavine, you have to go back through and remove all those tags. Um, the same thing with short codes. Even if you're using an ad inserter type plugin where you put it like a short code where the brackets, and I know this is kind of pre-block editor, but um, it's still possible to do that kind of thing where you have to go through and clean that up. Um, so you could use reusable blocks um, as an option um, if you're careful with those. Um, but I just want want you to think about that in advance. Like think think down the road, how am I gonna, like I don't want anybody to paint themselves into a corner, I guess is maybe the best way to put it. Um, if you do want, <laughs> oh Lord, here it comes. Thanks, Arson. Um, if you, if you do want, um, to use a plugin to help you with that, um, ad inserter is a pretty good option. Um, and there's a pro version as well. Let me get you the link for that for a quick second. Um, oops, for the trailing slash there, sorry. Um, and so that can do things like insert an AdSense code every fourth paragraph, that kind of thing. Um, but I do want to underscore what Arson just said is, you know, if you're if you're looking at making ten dollars a month from ads, you're better off just not doing the ads, not trying to recoup your, you know, like I see a lot of people are being like, I'm paying twenty dollars a month for hosting, I have to recover that cost, and I think you're slowing yourself down, and you're you're actually going to you know, just get in your way and you're better off spending your time creating great content and building your traffic so you can get into one of the bigger networks. Of course, ads are just one of the ways we're going to talk about with monetizing, right? Yes. Yeah, definitely. We're going to expand a little bit more. Um, but Andrew, as a fellow blogger yourself and an SEO, uh, what are some realistic figures that a blogger can expect to make in the beginning? And I'm, I'm sure there's going to be variations and lots of it depends that's coming, but what are the reasons for the variations? Um, so it depends on how many ads, if it's ads, it depends on how many ads you're running, what network you're using, all of those things, you know, every ad unit will have an RPM number, right? It's a revenue per thousand RPM is melee thousand. Um, so the number is always like for per thousand impressions, how much does it pay? You know, and, and an individual ad might be $2 to $4, somewhere in that range. So you put four ads and you could be making $15 RPM across your page views, right? So a thousand page views gets you $15. Um, I know in Q4 with video and with, you know, sticky ads and all the things that Mediavine and AdThrive in particular are doing, you, we, it's not unheard of to see a 70 or $80 RPM. Um, that's high, um, but like I see people reporting that in the forums. And so that's like the, the holy grail. And then when you like, don't touch your site, just keep it running and, you know, watch it rain money. Um, that that's not the norm. Um, you know, I'd say Q4, uh, 30 to $45 is kind of the numbers I've been seeing around. Um, and Abby jump in if, if I'm off here. Um, I think the, the topic makes a big difference. Um, you know, I, my blog is healthy eating, um, right. And it's also neglected for many years, uh, but it has never performed as well on an RPM basis because it's all about healthy food and I've excluded junk food ads and I've excluded all these things. Like I don't want ads for handguns to show up. Like I've limited a lot of the stuff because I think it's off brand. And so I've also narrowed the pool of what I'm willing to make money on. Um, so in terms of like actual figures, 
Um, I mean, I'll, I'll share my revenue numbers on eating rules on my food blog right now. It's on Mediavine. Um, the traffic has dwindled because I've neglected it because I'm so busy helping everybody with their own sites. Um, and I'm getting about, I think we're in the range of like, it's in the range of like 30,000 page views a month. Um, and that's bringing in about $600 a month. So I'm kind of at the $20 RPM. Um, I'm loving it because I don't touch it and it's passive income. So I'm, you know, I'm grateful for that. It could be better <laughs> if I put some work into it, it would go back up. Um, um, but, you know, thankfully RPMs have actually been going up because of all the optimization that Thrive and Media and has been doing. So even as my traffic has been going down, the revenue has been kind of stable, which is really great. Um, I used to also sell sponsorships. Um, so for that, like this was a few years back, but, you know, it would be anywhere, um, I, I did some sponsored stuff, anywhere from five hundred dollars to a post to ten thousand dollars for a whole campaign, um, you know, and that was an involved project with multiple emails and coupons and product, you know, placement, and it was a big thing as part of my month long October on process challenge. So it depends. <laughs> okay, it right there. You did it perfectly though, but really that transparency is really helpful. It, it kind of gives, you know, every blog is going to be different. And then, like you mentioned, there's lots of different factors in there. Um, but you started to touch on brand sponsorships and Abby, that's definitely your specialty. Can you share a bit about how you get new brand sponsorships and what that process looks like? Like, how do you choose which brands to work with or do they choose you or... Yeah, so there are multiple ways of going about this, um, and we have a lot of great resources at Tastemaker about pitching brands, which I think you'll probably include that in any show notes that you'll all get that follow up if you haven't already accessed it and you're not a part of our community. But um, really, you start, there's multiple ways, right? You can join an agency where they already set a flat rate, and it's easy because you have somebody doing the work for you, and you're a part of their list and their roster, and they reach out to you based on, you know, your metrics, your demographics if you're a good fit. I will say I it's a good place, I think, to start. I used to do a lot of that type of sponsored work uh, just because it was easier. Uh, now it is more of a custom tailored one-on-one -on -one, uh, approach where I'm vetting the, the brand and really honing in on their values. If it aligns with what I'm doing on my site, if it's something I actually use, right? Because I think there needs to be a lot of uh, transparency around that. It's easy. I think when it, it, you see somebody offering you a lot of money, but you're like, oh, that doesn't really fit. I think everybody has at some point in their career, if they do sponsorships, you know, compromising, I think like the ethics of that, like, am I doing this just for the money or is this the right fit? Right. And I think that comes ultimately down to the whole conversation of user experience. Like this doesn't make sense. Like you need to make the right choice and make the next best decision there. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that's something to like look out for, but in terms of like getting the brand sponsorships with those people. I mean, it's a whole process of a pipeline, but identifying them, finding them on LinkedIn is a really good strategy. Finding people on, on social media, reaching out to, to the brand itself, sending them a pitch, but there's, there's a art, I think, to pitching brands and being able to talk to them and being able to find the right contact. There are a lot of different moving pieces that, that make it so that you can have more success that way. Could you give some examples of that? I, I'm really curious yeah. to hear on LinkedIn specifically. Are mm -hmm. you looking for a specific type of employee that works there? And how do you how do you find them? That's a great question. So I will speak on behalf of like the tastemaker side of things. Obviously, we are selling really large sponsorships, and I know it doesn't necessarily correlate to blog. Uh traffic and hey, this is what we can do for you. But we, lately, that's been a big strategy for us getting brand partnerships, um, just to, to give them access to the food blogging community so that they can then take advantage of those things. And we look for the marketing department specifically, right? Because a lot of times they are the ones who will be making those decisions. It also depends on the size of the company. If it is a huge corporation, right, there is a special marketing team you want to try to get and I think involved with somebody who is easy to get into, who will probably look at your, your message on LinkedIn because the CEO is not going to like give you the time of day, right, or any C-suite people. Like that's just not going to happen. Don't waste your time. Now, if it's a smaller company, you know, few employees, like I think that is the right person, right? They're the ones making the decision. So there's a lot of just knowledge that I think you have to have understanding how company structure works and who's making the decisions based on ad spend and budget. Um, so, you know, 
for example, I know our one of our account managers, Gabby, has been having a lot of success with reaching out to the right person and recently got in contact with a uh, beverage company and was able to pinpoint their the head of their marketing department. And they were able to then get in contact with, hey, we actually have an agency that represents us. We were able to talk to the right people. And then from there, it wasn't this whole drawn out process through email. The biggest piece of advice I can give anybody is get somebody face-to-face or on a phone call. Keep your emails short and sweet and to the point like, hey, we have this opportunity. We love your product. We really think this would be a, a great fit. Do you have time? to hop on a 15 minute call, make it as concise and detailed as possible. Um, so that people, you know, managing expectations, know, know what to expect. Uh, that has been really successful in terms of like advice, um, that is concrete and giving you a specific example in terms of reaching out on Instagram. I feel I've had better success just on my food blog side of things or content creation that, reaching out to brands that are smaller, right? So for example, like a, a barbecue sauce company uh, I have worked with and I, I reached out, I mean, it was years ago, but reached out to them. And I know Instagram and social media is changing, but I think DMs still function in that way that it's easy to um, find the right people that way and identify the marketing team probably runs their social media page on Instagram and just sending them a DM. And again, the same pitch that you send to them, this is what I do this is how this could benefit you, you know, and talking about the value that it adds to them and really understanding the value of what you as a creator are bringing to, to these brands and understanding the the nature of marketing is changing. Influencer marketing is more cost-effective. It's proven to, to be, uh, have a lot of benefits and a, a strong ROI and being able to speak to that and know what's going on in the industry is really crucial. So I think the before you do all of that, you need to understand what it is you're selling and why it's relevant and how you can prove an ROI because businesses want to know that information before they make an informed decision. Can I, can I throw in also, um, uh, the Tastemaker Conference is a fantastic way to meet brands. You know, Abby and her team are actually doing all the work to bring the brands to one place, to an expo hall, where you can literally walk up to them, give them your card and get their card and meet them. And they're there looking for people to sponsor ultimately because they're going to, you're going to help them get their message out. Right. So a lot of it is showing up and networking and making those connections face to face. So, you know, like literally Abby's team is doing the work for you. Right. Um, and finding those companies because they're, they want to do this. Um, I also realized a long time ago, the PR folks that often you work with, um, they'll represent multiple brands and they'll change jobs over the years and they keep their list. <laughs> so once you make a few connections and they know you do good work and they can trust you, they're going to start reaching out to you when they have, you know, when they need to get 10 sponsored posts or whatever it is. Right. So, um, it's, it takes a long time to build all, and cultivate those relationships, but, um, it's totally worth it. And it's kind of a long, long play, uh, to keep doing that. Yeah, good old fashioned PR. Um, Andrew, do you have any recommendations on how many views or impressions that your site should actually be getting before you reach out to brands? Like, is there kind of a baseline in the industry or does it depend? <laughs> um, you know, I think people obsess about it more than the brands do. Um, you know, what I what brands are looking for is your reach, not your impressions. So it's not just about page views anymore. It's about how many followers do you have on Instagram and how engaged are they? They're really looking at engagement. You know, if you've got a million followers, okay, you could have just bought those. You know, they might not be active or paying attention and reading. So they're going to be, they're going to look through the history and see, are you replying? Are people chiming in and saying they love the recipe and you're saying, thank you. And then, you know, like, is that engagement? Cause they want that. So when you share their content, the people are going to be engaged and it's going to really be effective. So it's about building that community with your audience. Um, so you can then connect your audience to the brand. Um, you know, I think you need to have some audience, but you don't need to be at a hundred thousand page views a month or more. Like you just need to have cultivated an audience. Um, and if it's small, you might be, you know, not charging as much, but you might be working with smaller brands who are trying to break into a specific niche. Right. So I think it's really all about that connection. Yeah. Abby, at the beginning, 
sometimes you can just take whatever brands will tell you this is what we're paying and you just say mm -hmm. awesome and thanks to start building up your portfolio and whatnot but once you're established you've worked with a couple of brands and you feel confident how do you decide what to charge and what are the different pillars of charging for different types of content good question and my answer is that i think there is a big shift happening in this industry in terms of pay equity and taking, again, taking content creators seriously, as in the, the content you are making is inherently valuable, especially if it's, if it's for a brand and you're doing recipe development and photography and videography, including their brand and product placement. I think you really have to think about it in terms of this brand can be taking this. Maybe you charged $500 to make this content for them and they turn around and depending on the terms of your contract, which if you're a newbie, you might not know this, you know, they take that, they have a contract that gives them all the rights to your images. They take that, they put it in a national campaign that turns around and makes them upwards of $2 million, right? For $500 that, that you charge. So I think like it's really, again, shifting your mindset around, you need to charge what you're worth based on your the time that it takes you and like your expertise in terms of the content. Because I think you can sell the content in multiple ways, even if you don't have a huge following um, and really like shifting that. So we have a, a pricing calculator that I have created based off how I do pricing, which some people disagree with this. And I think it's great to have different options based on what works for you, but to calculate the how much time it's going to take you, right? Assessing for an hourly rate of your time and then charging a, a, an amount based on your following and the audience, like Andrew was saying, that you have cultivated. There is value in that, that you can charge for that because that is exposure. They're also paying for that element of it. And then charging for your materials and factoring in a percentage of your your overhead uh, costs uh, to operate it, right? Your, your equipment. And your rental, your lease, if you're renting a studio, right? There are so many different factors depending on how you set up your business. And then factoring in, you are a, a freelancer and you likely don't have health insurance and all these other benefits, factoring in those percentages, your taxes. Like by the end of it, it's going to be a substantial number if you are valuing yourself properly and asking for what you deserve to get paid instead of being like, oh, here, we'll give you a coupon for $10 for bread in exchange for you doing 20 hours of work, you know? So I just went on a tangent. I'm so sorry. I don't even know if I answered the question. <laughs> you, you above and beyond answered the question. And I absolutely love that there's a pricing calculator because pricing yourself is one of the hardest things to do we always undervalue ourselves and our time. And unless there's an example or an industry standard out there, mm -hmm. a baseline is just really difficult to come up with. So the pricing calculator is fantastic. Uh, the link for it is dropped in the chat, but don't worry, it will be in the show notes um, in the blog post recap as well. Can I, can I just say a note about pricing? I'm sorry to interrupt again, but um, someone very wise once told me, the more you charge, the more you're worth. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're charging too little, you're saying you're sending a message saying, hey, my work and everything I'm going to do for you isn't actually worth that much. And so you're actually you're doing yourself a disservice and you're in, saying, don't hire me. And the brands you want to work with are going to want to pay the rate because they know what you're worth and they want to, you know, there needs to be that mutual valuation there. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, having said that, if there's like a $500 stand mixer that you really, really, really want, do the post and get the stand mixer. Totally. You know, like that's okay too. Um, you know, don't do it for a, a loaf of bread. But you know, I mean, I used to do posts just because I wanted the product, and it was what's what's you know. wrong with bread? <laughs> At least two loaves. At least two loaves. You know, but but you know, you're right. We also you can't get paid, you know, through exposure, right? And so you don't want to make that a habit. But it, or if you're just starting out, and that's a great experience, um, you know, I think that's okay. But you just have to know that that's what you're doing it for, and that's why. Yeah, and not to expect anything different. That makes sense. Um, Andrew, kind of switching back into the technical side of things for sponsored content. Um, okay, so you've created the content, you're posting it on your website. Let's call it a blog post and a video for example purposes. What do you need to have on that blog post? Do you have to say that, hey, 
the brand's paying me for this. H how do you say that? Yes, you have to say that. Uh, sorry, my doorbell just rang very aggressively. <laughs> aggressive doorbell. <laughs> it's very aggressive. Um, I'm tried. not going to that. Um, can you hear that? It's still going. Um, anyway, sorry. Um, yes, legally, you need to do this. Um, so if you if there's any sort of financial or uh, compensation, even if you get a free loaf of bread, you need to disclose that it is sponsored content. Um, you can get into legal trouble if you don't. Um, it's also just good practice and it builds trust with your audience. Um, so it's a win-win. Um, the requirements are basically you have to say, this is sponsored. I received this. You don't have to say how much you received, but if you got paid, you can say I was paid to post this or it's sponsored. You know, you need to communicate in that some way that in some way. Um, and you have to say it before any links or any reviews. You can't just bury it at the bottom of the post. So that's very important. Um, also, technically, from a Google perspective, this isn't a legal thing, but it's an SEO thing. Any links on that page in the content need to be tagged as no follow or sponsored. Um, if you don't do that, Google may penalize you. So um, you want to make sure you do that. Um, the other thing I'd suggest, and this is just a, here's a bonus tip for those of you on the call. Um, in your contract with them, put a, um, a minimum amount of time that you're obligated to have the content on your website. You could say this post will be up for at least a year, right? Um, but you want to have some sort of end date in there that they agree to. So that way you're free to remove it after that time has elapsed. Because if you don't do it, it you don't know how long. Like I've got some sponsored content that six years later, I'm like, oh, I really want to delete this, but I don't know if they're going to get pissed at me, you know? So have that in the contract up front. Um, and if they want it to be two years, you can negotiate that. But um, that that should be something that's that's known up front to prevent issues later. I think Abby wants to add to that. I'm raising my hand on that. I think those that's one of those things that you can upsell, right? That you can say, as this post grows and gains momentum, it's going to get more eyeballs and more exposure for you. If you want, you know, come up with a minimum, I have a three month minimum policy. If you want a year, if you want two years, whatever, you should be charging for that. Who's at your door, Andrew? I think it's Casey. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm hoping that I'm hoping Maddie just grabbed it. But. Candy corn delivery. <laughs> um, does it make sense to say after a year remove that content? Like, do you actually find yourself wanting to remove that content, or are you creating that content to where it still aligns with your brand? And this could be Abby, Andrew, either one of you, but you both kind of just touched on this concept. So I'm just really curious why you would want to delete it. Is it because it's advertised? For, for me, it's um, because I had a lot of giveaways. This was this was like 2011, 2012, where you know giveaways actually helped get a lot of traffic. Um, and they might have a review, but it was clearly like, um, you know, hey, I got this product, we've got this recipe. You know, they gave me a recipe to, to share or something, and I did a giveaway that kind of went viral. Um, and it wasn't it wasn't valuable content. Um, so that's the kind of thing I want to get rid of. If it's uh, a sponsored post that's using a product, but the post itself standalone is good and it wasn't sponsored. And I, you know, if it wasn't sponsored, I would say I'd want to keep it, then yeah, I'm going to want to keep it. And to add to that, I think that goes back to the original point I was making that be intentional about the brands that you're working with. I think if it's something that you wouldn't want to put on your blog anyway, that you feel like you need to delete it, should you be doing a sponsored post? Right. Important questions to ask yourself. Yep. Definitely. Um, are some brand sponsorships tend to lead to affiliate marketing, which you know means money, but also links. So what are the general rules and recs when it comes to affiliate links on posts? Like, can you have too many affiliate links on a single post? How are you supposed to follow, no follow these links? What's the technical part of the links? Right. So, I mean, uh, and there was a question that, that, uh, um, was put into chat. If you have questions, put them in the, into the QA so we can answer them later and, and include them in the, in the write-up. Uh, but yeah, so, uh, definitely no follow or rel sponsored on them. Um, you don't want to just leave affiliate links as is, uh, um, like Andrew said, Google will ding you for it. Um, and you know, there's also in, in some situations we have seen like, Oh, this is, this is mainly written for affiliate purposes. Uh, this post is written that it brings very little value so on and so forth. And that if done over and over and over again, this, your site might get affected by one of the updates from Google. Uh, so you definitely want to be very strategic about it. You want to make sure that it, it's, it makes sense. 
uh, from a content perspective that what you're doing, you're not just putting up like, here's all my favorite things. And it's just like, you know, links to Amazon. Uh, give context, make it work, make it helpful, make it useful. And uh, definitely add the, the, the rel nofollow, uh, rel sponsored. Uh, both are the same. Uh, nofollow, if you're confused, just do nofollow. Uh, um, Google will treat them the same way. But yeah, uh, that's, that's how I would handle that. I like how you snuck in helpful content with a helpful content update. Well played. Um, Andrew, we talked about ads a little bit in the beginning, but ads can really create like a terrible user experience. So lots of bloggers submitted questions about how many ads is too many to have, or what if ads slow down my page, but they're the way to make money. So what are some key indicators maybe inside of Google Analytics or Google Search Console that a blogger can tell, okay, by adding these ads, I'm not getting as much traffic as I thought I would, or people aren't staying on as long. Um, well, I think before you even dig into analytics, just pick up your actual phone and go to your site and try to use your site. Um, you know, I search for recipes and, you know, we, out of the search results, I'll click on my client sites first, of course, and then I go to their site and I can't even find the recipe because there's a footer ad, the video is over it, there's a slick stream is dropped, like there's, there's this much screen real estate left for the actual content and I can't actually get to the recipe. So try to use your own site. If you can't use it to cook a recipe from it, your readers certainly won't be able to. Um, so that's when you know you've got to dial it back. I know it feels like it costs more, but long-term it's gonna be a win. Um, in terms of the technical analytics, I think the time on site metric is probably the best one to watch. Um, you know, if, you, um, if your average time on site is probably, I don't know, let's say a minute um, or two minutes and you, you suddenly, you bump up your ads and you see that number go down, that's a pretty good indicator that people don't wanna be there, they're sticking around, they're not getting what they want. Um, bounce rate's a little harder to track because it's high on food blogs anyway. Um, you know, if you do an adjusted bounce rate where it's looking at the time, that can help. Um, but, um, you know, I think you're better off probably just looking at real user experience. You know, you could give your phone to somebody and say, hey, can you, you know, watch them use your site um, and see how they interact with it. Um, but if, if you look at your site and think it's too many ads, then it's definitely too many ads. I like, uh, sorry, I'm going to cut in real fast. Um, uh, to what Andrew said, uh, if usually if for those of you who have, who have had consultations with me, uh, I like to unblock my ad blocker I reload your page. I like to play the game called count the ads. Uh, um, and just as we're scrolling and you can really get a feel for the, like the user experience and the diminished user experience when you're actually looking at it that way and you're counting the ads. Uh, um, every other, every paragraph or between images or when you're loading your recipe card and just the recipe card itself already has two ads and one video in it, it's already distracting. It's, it's, it's really bad for user experience. And I have seen improvements in performance when you start cutting down those ads, performance from, from web performance perspective and from positioning and ranking. Because Google is aware of those ads. Google understands how many ads you're loading in there. Uh, um, so definitely be very mindful of it. Uh, uh, back in the day, uh, before I got into SEO, I used to do affiliate marketing and all of that. And we used to very carefully examine how much money each ad uh, unit on that, on that page is making us. Uh, um, and again, it's one of those, one of those like finding the, the, the middle ground. So if you're seeing ad units and you're seeing that, that, oh, I'm not, this one is not really doing much for me, like the sidebar ad, let's say, right. Uh, 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 get rid of it. It's causing more harm than good. You're not making that much money from it, but it's slowing down everything. So definitely I would say audit and look at what's happening when those ads are loaded, where they're loaded, how they're loaded, position and, 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 and frequency. Uh, and the more of that you do, trust me, you'll start making more money because you're not going to be filtered out uh, by the algorithm as much. Because you said the word audit, I, I have to ask, how frequently should you actually perform that exercise and how much time? Do you I mean, need look, to it's one of those things that you, you, you've you optimized that you look at, you, I don't know how frequently people look at their like at Thrive or, or Mediavine dashboards and, and see what's happening there and how granular you get into it. When this is all I used to do, I used to get very granular and I used to check it every week just to make sure that it's, it's, it's all making sense. Uh, uh, but it's, it's completely up to you. I don't, unless you're seeing issues, I wouldn't necessarily go crazy with it, but unless you're seeing issues and you're seeing declines, definitely be very, uh, uh, on top of it. 
Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. That's All a right. good rule of thumb. Um, Andrew, I've got to ask, and I'm going to give you the hard question. Oh. Mediavine or AdThrive? It depends. <laughs> <laughs> Who do you like? Who's better? What should bloggers do? They're both good. Um, huh. They... <laughs> Yeah, no, I'll just no. I, can, I know you're gonna want more more answer than that. Um, I do. No, they're both they're both good networks. Um, the the trick is, they, I think they approach things a little differently. They're philosophically differently, um, and so the the thing to remember is an ad network actually works for you. You don't work for them. Um, they're your you know they're an, an agent for you who is getting you money and they're taking a cut of it. Uh, for their services. Um, so I think a lot of it is who you want to work with the most, who you trust the most. Um, if you like their approach to ad serving, um, you know, the, if you like the tools they give you, um, you know, it's not just the RPM. Um, you know, it's really hard to tease out who makes more money on RPMs. Um, you know, when every site's a little different. So I, I, for as many people as I've heard say, I moved from Mediavine to AdThrive and I made more money, I've heard the opposite. Um, and it really, unfortunately, it's hard to compare apples to apples on that because things are always shifting, right? And um, you know, if you ch if you change on October first to another ad network, you're going to earn a lot more money on that new ad network because it's the beginning of Q4 and it's only going to increase over the next few months. So the timing of the moves makes a big difference. Um, I've heard anecdotally they both play a lot of tricks where if you tell them you're leaving and you have 30 days, they'll bump the ads up to make it look like you have more revenue right before you leave. I don't know if that's true, but I've heard people repeatedly say that. So there are some shenanigans that can happen. Um, I think ultimately um, the best way to do it is look at um, them as a business partner and a collaborator and to decide who you want to work with the most. And so you should have some conversations with them about that. Um, I will say from a technical perspective, and I'm probably going to get in trouble for this, um, we have a harder time with layout shift on AdThrive compared to Mediavine. That's a fact. Um, it is possible to pass Core Web Vitals, I'm sorry, be in the good range for Core Web Vitals on both networks. Um, it, is, it is harder for us with AdThrive. We've worked with them a lot. Um, and um, they just, their ads, they're, they're shifting more. Um, and so Mediavine has made that a bigger priority and, and done more. Um, it's not a huge difference, but if, if one of your goals is to be in the good range for uh, CLS and LCP, um, actually they're both fine for LCP. Um, it is a little harder with that thrive, I will say. Um, and I, ha I actually have data to back that, that up. Um, but, Again, doable on both. So that's not reason to switch. Like, don't, I don't want, I don't want to hear from AdThrive that I told everybody to switch to Mediavine because of that. So don't don't say that. Um, but uh, I'd say go with who you're comfortable with. That was a great answer. Thank you, Bert. Immediately regret answering yeah. questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Right. It over to you, Arson. Okay. So have you, Arson, ever seen a case where working with an ad company actually neg negatively affected a client site? So look, uh, yes, but uh, um, so as I said earlier, when we, when we, at the beginning of the webinar, the delivery mechanism for the ads um, could, could potentially not be optimized and that could cause a lot of web performance issues. Uh, um, I've seen improvements when those ads or that that delivery process was removed from a site and that improved the, the 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 positioning and traffic and everything else so again it's one of those things that you have you have to pick your battles either you're going to make a little bit less money improve your web performance and then qualify for these better uh, more advanced networks that pay better have better technology better delivery or you're going to struggle with web performance and continue to make very little money with uh, the not with the not so top shelf uh, ad networks. Again, not going to name any names, but you know it's it's you know who the top players are. Totally, that makes sense. All right, so we're on to our final question. So if you have not dropped a question that you'd like answered in the Q and A, please do so now. There's also 14 questions already in there. So if you see any that you'd love to know the answer to, you can actually hit that thumbs up button and then that will bring it to the top. So when we're picking what questions to answer right now when we go live, those are the ones that we're gonna address first. 
Um, last question is going to you, Abby. I mean, this episode is all about making money from your content. So aside from brand sponsorships and aside from ads, the two things that we talked about the most, mm -hmm. how the heck can you make money from your content? What do you recommend? I think it's a matter of, like I said before, identifying what skill set have I developed as a creator and how can I monetize that? And I think sometimes we undervalue the skill sets that we're perhaps cultivating off the screen. Um, and I, I say that based on my experience just with with creating Tastemaker and creating an event around that, which has been by and large like the biggest uh, source of income for me just because I, I put a lot of my focus in there. So I think it's just a matter of getting creative and realizing that there are so many ways to make money. And I think it's really working on your mindset around that and getting curious and getting to understand, you know, what am I good at? What lights me up? What's my zone of genius? And try to figure out how you can incorporate that into your, your blog, if it makes sense. But I've seen so many food bloggers go and start out with a food blog and then they, they end up building, you know, like a huge food photography company, or they start an agency or they're, they realize they're really good at, at the organizational stuff and they become, you know, a, a digital marketing manager or a VA or start an agency that way. And so I think just don't, don't limit yourself and be just so myopic in, in the one thing and, and be open-minded that way. Definitely. There's even courses I've been seeing so many bloggers release courses now on topics that you wouldn't think that would be a course topic. And then all these people are signing up because they want to learn about it too. So there's a ton of different ways these days to make money from your content. But that officially leads us into the Q&A. So first question is going to be from Nisha. This is a great question. What determines your RPM? Anybody? I can take a step. Arson, go ahead. No, no, no. I, I, I was going to say I can only assume. I mean, it's, it's. I'm sure it's different for every ad network, uh, or a little bit different. Uh, but it has to do with the content and the vertical that you're in as well. Uh, I know some bloggers from the bloggers that I work with, uh, bloggers that are uh, typically DIY has higher RPMs than food bloggers. Uh, finance, I think, has higher RPMs. Uh, I know, I know content that is placed with, so like uh, if you post, if, you, if you're looking at individual post level, because your, your different posts also monetize the different RPMs, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so I know posts that, that uh, um, so like if, if you're writing about like, here's a recipe that I made with this like really expensive appliance or kitchen appliance, those will tend to monetize a little bit higher. The RPMs will be higher because those are big ticket items. Uh, um, but I'm sure that there's a lot that goes into that calculation. It's actually, you know, there are people bidding on advertising. So one of the reasons Mediavine and AdThrive in particular are so particular about who they accept in the network is because they need to make sure the quality of the content stays really high because they are actually going out and selling you to advertisers, right? Uh, you know, it's a block of 8,000 websites or 10,000 websites or whatever their numbers are, but you're one of them, right? And so they need to make sure that the advertisers want to buy ads in the Mediavine network. Um, so it's all about quality content as well as the the topics, um, you know, it, the more ads you run, you know, each individual ad has an RPM. Um, so, you know, some ads might be $2, some might be $4, like they might be paying more, but then your overall RPMs are going to be also skewed by um, how many ads you're running as well. Um, video also monetizes really well. It pays more, right? Um, or if you do those really obnoxious overlay ads, um, please don't. But if you do them, they tend to pay more because they get the reader's attention, right? So the advertisers know that, so they're willing to pay more for that. Um, so the type of ads you run as well will impact RPMs. I also want to add, this is purely anecdotal. Correlation does not equal causation here, but I'm I'm also curious. Also, I can't chat with you guys, so sorry if I have not been responding. I, I don't have access to that, but um, I'm curious if people have experienced this from hearing other food bloggers talk about their RPMs. As, as their traffic goes up, their RPMs continue to follow that trajectory too. So again, I'm not the expert there. I don't know if that is in fact a thing, but I have heard that from other people. Um, next question, Abby, I'm going to send it on over to you from Marissa. How do you find agencies to join for freelance work and sponsorships for someone who's just getting started? 
Oh, there are, there's a lot. And honestly, I don't have like a directory. Um, that's a good resource though, in my mind to think, oh, that's something, you know, we could create to help you. But there, I would just start asking around like in Facebook groups. This is where your community and networking comes in to, to crowdsource ideas around that. And I think like a quick Google search too. But again, sometimes you might get some not top tier agencies. Uh, the, the, a lot of times those, if you are starting out, those agencies will nickel and dime you and say, oh, we'll give you a $50 gift card for X amount of work. Um, so yeah, I would just say, look around, ask people, trusted resources, and um, I will take that as a note to also do the work for you to figure that out. The best. <laughs> Arson, this one's coming to you next from Jocelyn. Um, I don't have any ads yet on my site. Is it good to group H2s with the content now while we're writing blog posts so that when we do qualify for ad networks, we do not have ads being inserted and breaking up sentences? Yes. Thanks for the question, Jocelyn. Lovely. Perfect. Uh, next question from Amanda. Percentage-wise, what is the best percent for ads? I, I knew this question was going to come at some point. <laughs> Google suggests nothing over than 30%. So what's the happy balance? 20%, 24%, 28%, 22.2%? What do you guys think? This percentage is referring to ad density, right? That's what the right. name of this metric. Um, I think 30% is considered a max, right? So I think it goes back to what we were talking about before of trying to strike that balance. You know, some of it depends on, do you write five sentence paragraphs or one sentence paragraphs, right? Um, and so I think it's about the the visual layout and how dense it is. You know, is there, are there two ads on the screen as you're scrolling by or just one per screen? Um, so I think it's the, the percentage, I don't know if there's a specific number. Um, I think 30% is just the maximum you can do. So it depends. Uh, yeah, that one's that one's a little difficult to fully fully give exact number. So you did good, Andrew. Um, question from Wendy: What is the best way to monetize a food blog with about twenty five thousand page views? Get to fifty thousand. Yeah, <laughs> work on increasing your traffic if you want ad revenue, right? It, for those of you on the call, I really need you to know that you need to identify your goals of what you're wanting. How much money do you want to be making? You need to figure that out first and then align your actions with what is moving me, moving the needle for me to do that. Do you want passive income? Then you need to focus on your SEO for the next year if it's not there to get on with an ad ad network. Do you want to make money now and you're you're good at photography or you have a skill set that you can monetize and market immediately? Start diving into, you know, can I freelance? Can I create content for other other creators? Can I um, do food photography? You know, the, there's a lot of different ways to think about that. Um, can I can I add also? Um, you could make a hundred thousand dollars a year with twenty five thousand page views a month. You're not going to do it with ads, but if you build a good product that is has value for your audience that they're willing to pay for, you could do that. You know, twenty twenty five thousand page views. If you convert one percent of your visitors, right? What that's twenty five hundred sales, even you know less than that. Like, and so you're selling a hundred dollar product, and you convert a percentage of your visitors. You could be selling directly. So I just want to throw that out there as like another way to do that, to create revenue and have multiple revenue streams. It's not just sponsored posts or ads. Um, you know, there's a lot of different paths here. Helpful. Another question just got accepted by Mediavine. Yay, congrats. Is there a guide on best practice for myself and users on how to manage the ads? Abby, do you have anything at Tastemaker for this or is this a potential new content guide? So, so I would like to also for, for purpose of ethics, Tastemaker is, is sponsored by Mediavine. They are a presenting title sponsor. So, and I also have been with them forever and have a, a loyalty and love for them. And I, we don't have anything directly, but I will say that their team is incredibly helpful. If you go to their website, fill out you know their contact form or chat with them, uh, they're really prompt in getting back to you. Uh, also, if any of you want any resources, you can always reach out to me and send me an email too, and I can connect you that way as well. Perfect. Uh, and Abby, if you don't mind chatting me your email, I can drop it into chat so then the attendees have access to that. Um, Arson, this question is going to you. I think you 
fairly addressed it, but should Amazon affiliate links also be marked sponsored in addition to nofollow or did you only do one? one? You don't need to do both. Just one. Is there a preference? It's the same thing. Google will treat them exactly the same. As long as you're, as long as you're annotating saying that this is a link, this is, this is a monetized link, right? Like I'm making money through this. This is not a link that I am referencing another piece of content as a citation or, um, you know, it's like basically saying, uh, uh, like, don't, don't pass any value from my page to this page. Right. Uh, um, but yeah, uh, rel no follow or, or, uh, sponsored is fine. Either one. You don't have to do both. Can I, can I piggyback on that? Just to clarify a point earlier, because David asked about this in the Q and a, um, when I said you have to make all your links, uh, no follow on a sponsored post, um, not your own links, links to the sponsor need to be the ones that are no follow. So your internal links can still be do follow. That's, that's cool. It's just anything, you know, Google doesn't want to see you trying to game the system and somebody paying you to put a link on their site is gaming the system unless, so that's your way of saying, no, 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 it's, I'm getting paid. So it's not, you know, I'm not trying to pull any shenanigans. That's and generally you should, you should probably not, don't, don't no follow internal links. It's not a good practice. Also, total non sequitur, apparently the doorbell was UPS, and they really, really, really needed to have a signature. So that's what was going on there. What <laughs> Would was you get it? delivered? Yeah. What was it? I, I don't what even know. I, sorry, Maddie, Maddie didn't tell me that. So <laughs> hoping it was somebody sending wine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Somebody, a, Amy just wrote wine. <laughs> <laughs> I'll report back next month. <laughs> uh, we clearly know you just a little bit. All right. So the final question, I know there's still questions in the Q&A, but don't worry, they will get answered in the recap blog post that gets published a week later. Uh, but final question, Arsene, if you could please clarify this, can you please explain what grouping H2s with the content means in relation to the question that was asked earlier? What does it mean to group your H2s? So like essentially breaking your content up into, into, into sections uh, uh, using the H2 uh, uh, so that it's not like uh, um, all the paragraphs are kind of squeezed together. Gotcha. Okay. So I, th I, I think that might be referencing also, like I know some of the ad networks, you can wrap sections of things in an empty div tag and they right. will put ads inside a div. Right. Um, so that way the ad will go like above the next section, but so you'll have these blocks. That doesn't mean put the entire section into an H2 tag. Right. Uh, so it's just don't wrap all of it in, in an H2. Wouldn't that be great? An entire paragraph as an H2? No. Oh. <laughs> Don't do that. Immediately realized. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that wraps up today's episode. Abby, Andrew, Arson, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing all of your wisdom. Um, again, we will publish the recap blog post next week. You will get an email with a link to that. Otherwise, you can always go to Top Hat Ranks blog and it, it will be posted there. But have a great rest of your day, evening, morning, and thank you everyone for tuning in. Did we do a group picture already? We did like five. Oh, great. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Abby. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Bye. Bye, everybody.